preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good evening once again to A Lens on America Political Perspectives. Annette Insdorf, who has been scheduled to moderate this evening, has been somewhat detained. She will be with us for the second film, and therefore I have comments that were prepared uh, by our moderators that I will share about our first film. Before I do so, I want to just spend one moment, this being the next to last night of the festival, um, and point out or at least introduce you to an individual who really took charge of this festival, developed it, and attracted the speakers, chose the films, was the principal moving force <clears throat> behind putting together this first-rate and extraordinary film festival. I'm speaking about the associate director of the education department, B.J. Gluckstern, who is in the back of the hall, and I wanted to acknowledge her uh, in front of the audience this evening. Thank you. Again, I want to encourage you to take a look at some of the brochures which we've provided you. Um, they represent some of the lecture series that will take place next year at the Y, some of those that we think you may find of particular interest. We hope that you have enjoyed this festival, and we very much hope that you will join us again during the coming year at both our film programs and our lecture series. Emile D'Antonio created this 97-minute film, Point of Order, from 188 hours of kinescopes of the live television coverage of the United States Senate's Army McCarthy hearings. Like the Watergate hearings 20 years later, they kept a vast audience glued to their sets and helped to change history. The Army and Senator McCarthy had clashed. The Senator had announced his intention of rooting out communists from the Army as he had tried to do in the civilian agencies of government. The Army, resisting this pressure, countered that McCarthy, through his close associate Roy Cohn, had sought favorable treatment for Private David Schein, a former McCarthy aide. Thomas Dewey, ex-governor of New York, recommended Joseph Walsh, Welsh, a conservative Boston lawyer, as special counsel to represent the Army before the Senate Committee of Investigation. It was a clash that recalled William Jennings Bryan and Clarence Darrow at the Scopes trial. Welsh and McCarthy fought each other, theatrically, ruthlessly and with a mastery of parliamentary tactics. The clash was political theater, a mesmeri mesmerizing spectacle that exposed McCarthy as a bully and manipulator and destroyed his mystique. Other senators turned on him. He was later censured and soon after lost his immense power to terrify and intimidate. D'Antonio's film recaptures the essence of the events 10 years later and inspired such political collage films as Are You Now or Have You Ever Been, The Trial of the Catonsville Nine, and In the Manner of J. Robert Oppenheimer. Following Point of Order at 8.15, The Unquiet Death of Ethel and Julius Rosenberg will be screened. And as you know, following the second film, Robert and Michael Mirapol will be with us to comment on the film and their contemporary import. Ladies and gentlemen, Point, point of Order. Good evening. I'm Annette Insdorf, and I'm very proud to welcome you this evening to the 92nd Street Y for our program on McCarthy and the Red Scare. I'd like to remind you that tomorrow evening is the last in our program, Politics in the South, and we have as our guest speaker Charles Morgan, Jr., former director of the uh, ACLU Washington office and Southern Regional Director as well. The film that many of you saw this evening, Point of Order, reveals the paranoid 50s, the tone of the 50s, the Cold War era in which demagogues of the right, like Joe McCarthy, were able to wave the word communist like a flag any time that they disagreed with someone or felt threatened by someone. The bull that charged in these times was the American machinery of blacklisting, red baiting, repression, persecution, the denial of individual freedom and uh, also the denial of pluralism, which for many of us is a very basic fact of American existence. It's in this context that tonight's film, The Unquiet Death of Ethel and Julius Rosenberg, must be seen. Indeed, many of you might notice a direct connection because uh, the two films this evening both have Roy Cohn. He was Joe McCarthy's chief counsel, 
and he was one of the prosecutors in the Rosenberg case. The unquiet death of Ethel and Julius Rosenberg was made in 1975 by Alvin Rosenfield, more than 20 years after the execution of its subjects. Also, I might add, the film took shape in the aftermath of Watergate. Now, this is not irrelevant to a film that explores the role of the FBI and the CIA in the American system, the role of the press, and the degree to which we can really know what American leaders are doing in the name of the people. Like Missing, this film raises questions about American justice, which are grave, volatile, and difficult to substantiate. At the same time, I think that it should be pointed out that as with Missing, the film has been made and shown in America, and this illustrates two basic values. First of all, the freedom to question what we think is unjust, and secondly, the responsibility for vigilance implicit in this freedom. This evening, our guests are Robert and Michael Mirapol, the sons of Ethel and Julius Rosenberg. You've been given index cards, and either during the film or after the film, if you want to jot, data, jot, jot, data, jot down a question, uh, do so, and the usher will come by and pick them up. And afterwards, when we have our discussion on stage, after I've posed a few questions, we will use the questions from the audience. I should say that Robert and Michael Mirapol were adopted in 1957 by Anne and Abel Mirapol. Michael is now an associate professor of economics at Western New England College. Robert is co-director of the Peace Development Fund, a political organization, a public foundation too, out of Amherst, funding the building of grassroots peace movements. Since 1974, they have traveled extensively speaking about their parents' case. They have filed a precedent-setting Freedom of Information Act lawsuit to obtain the government's, uh, the government's files in the matter. And in 1975, they wrote a book, We Are Your Sons, which was published by Houghton Mifflin and which contains 150 letters with the parents. More from them after the film, now the unquiet death of Ethel and Julius Rosenberg. Thank you. To my, to my far right is Michael Mirapol, and to my near right is Robert. First of all, how do you feel about this film? It was shown on television twice. Did it help? Well, I, I hope everybody realizes that this film is, uh, despite the fact that we're here speaking with it, this film is the product of an independent investigative journalist, Alvin Goldstein. This is not a film made by us or any committee that's been involved in the camp. It's not a film that's been, not a film that's been made by us or anybody who's been involved in any of the campaigns. Uh, I think that it's an extremely able effort to get at the facts in the case. Given that, remember, in 1973 there wasn't one single secret FBI or other government document available so that they had to go after oral testimony, they had to have Roy Cohn say one thing and then our researchers say another thing and leave it up to the audience to decide. And I think given the limitations, they were able to do a very fine job, first of all of presenting it and then of raising a lot of questions. They didn't answer them and I think that uh, the FBI files since then have answered some of them, they haven't answered all of them, but to answer the other part of your question, yes, it definitely helped. It raised tremendous interest in the country and it made people want to know more. And that was one of the reasons there was such support for our Freedom of Information Act lawsuit, and that's the reason there was such support for efforts to reopen the case. It, it helps in, in, in more specific ways as well. Uh, in, in traveling and speaking, uh, it often takes 45 minutes to set up the case uh, to try to point out why certain things are crucial. The film does an excellent job of focusing in on the fact that it's a relatively simple case. Uh, there are a couple of key links, and if you break those links, it all falls apart. And it's, in other words, it's, it focuses attention on the right spots in the case, and that's very important. I have, I have also a more personal reaction in, in seeing it again. Uh, I always, uh, 
it was the first time that Michael and I had ever done anything public, and uh, I always sort of regret that I turn out as the moment of comic relief uh, in, in the movie. Uh, I also resolve when we, when we are together on stage. I notice that Michael talks a lot more than I do, and I, I decide, well, this time, this time is going to be different. Uh, somehow I'm not so sure. <laughs> Well, there's still time for people to fill out the cards. If you want to address a question specifically to Robert, um, put that on your card and I'll try to abide. Now, this film was completed in 1975. I imagine that there's quite a bit of new material since then. Yeah, um, I want to... We could go on all night. Uh, briefly. Uh, but, uh, again, to point up the highlights, uh, the, the code word, I come from Julius, which in the tapes are so dramatically revealed to be Bob sent me or Benny sent me or something like that or John sent me. Uh, in getting FBI files, uh, which by the way there are still, I'm not sure of the exact figure, but at least 100,000 files that various government agencies are refusing to release on grounds of national security. Uh, this is, you know, India has an atomic bomb. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not a great secret. Uh, that never was. But from the FBI documents, you have some very graphic illustrations of how the case was orchestrated. For instance, uh, it was claimed by the FBI and then later on in a, in a famous FBI internal review of the case in which they naturally concluded that everything was, was fine, uh, that green glass and gold were never brought together. That it had been the contention of the defense that they orchestrated their testimony together and the FBI said that was impossible and they were never together in the same place at the same time. And for them to have been brought together before the trial would have been a very damaging piece of information uh, to the government's case. We now have an FBI document dated late December 1950, which is months before the trial occurred in which the document states, starts out, the, the opening line is, Harry Gold was interviewed in the tombs, which is the New York prison, in the presence of David Greenglass. Uh, and at, it goes on to describe the interview about how Gold couldn't remember the code word, uh, but when it was suggested that possibly it was Julius sent me, he then brightened up and said, yes, yes, that's the case. Uh, and that sort of corroborates uh, the FBI agent's own statement um, in the film, though it also puts David Greenglass, which the FBI agent neglected to mention, uh, there as well. And so another thing, the FBI, ag the FBI agent made it sound like this happened in July. Remember he had the word, when the trail from Greenglass led to Rosenberg, I asked Harry, could it have been Julius? Well, in August, which is a month later than July, even in 1950, a lot of other things were topsy-turvy in 1950, but that one was still true. Uh, Gold had said under oath, the code was, I bring greetings from Ben. Uh, when they met in December, uh, Greenglass said at this meeting, Ben wouldn't have meant anything to me. Now, if you had said greetings from Julius, that would have meant something, and that's when the FBI said, ah, Gold brightened up and began the process of remembering he still wasn't sure in December. It took him till I think, February before there's a memo that says, Gold is now positive, it's Julius. And of course, it had been orchestrated with them together. Uh, Alvin Goldstein didn't know that when he made the film. All he knew was that something fishy had gone on because he probed that FBI agent. He said, is it, is it really right to, to suggest something like that? Well, it was even worse than that. I mean, uh, they had them together to make sure that they didn't say opposite things at the trial. Less than two weeks ago, Alger Hiss lost another court battle in his 32-year attempt to clear his name from the communist uh, conspiracies of the 50s. How does that bear on your efforts? Well, I mean, the American judiciary and the, uh, the American system of justice, uh, if what we say is true, and the case was a frame-up and a fraud, um, are guilty of a monstrous crime, not just against our family and Morty Sobel, but against the American people in general. Now, to ask them to uh, investigate themselves, to uh, acknowledge that this is a possibility, to give our side the chance to subpoena witnesses, et cetera, is asking them to do an awful lot. 
So the failure of Alger Hiss to uh, win a new hearing is an example of the unwillingness of any organization to really honestly police itself. I am not very sanguine about getting a, any court in the United States to uh, look at this again. And uh, I'm not very sanguine of getting an official body to look at it again. We have to go to the unofficial bodies out here. And that's what we've been doing for uh, many, many years and we expect to continue doing it for a long, long time. I don't know how many of you remember, but it was 1978 in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts where Robbie and I live that the governor finally signed a proclamation declaring that from now on Sacco and Vanzetti are not guilty. Uh, that took a long time. That was 51 years after their execution. And uh, if the same thing happens, that'll be the year 2004. But we'll still be around and so will our children and so will a lot of us here. But I expect, to be honest, that the vindication comes from the knowledge of the people, from the writers, from the poets, from the playwrights, from the novel writers, and from the general ambience. And for that, all we have to do is let the facts come out, let the researchers dig, and let the chips fall where they may in terms of arguing this point, that point, back and forth. Uh, we're not afraid of the truth. Probably the most important point uh, to keep in mind is that uh, you know, we are all in the system, uh, some of us more than others, I suppose, given the way the system works, uh, liable to be juries. Uh, uh, I'll probably never be a juror. <laughs> uh, but uh, some of you have served on juries, I'm sure, and, and others will. Uh, and it is important to realize that there's a general pattern here in a political case, and that is that the people who are most reviled by the majority um, in power are linked with what the public fears the most. And once that link is made, it is the credibility of the government itself that, that drives home the point. Uh, and that can happen with different groups of people at different times. And it's very important for you to realize, if you ever serve on a jury, to look at the person who is, being, is, who is sitting in that chair and say, am I, is that person, does that, am I scared of what that person represents? And then think about the crime that the person is being accused of and make that linkage. And I like to think that when I speak about my parents' case, that if I, if I get one person to act in that critical manner, that, that that's reopening the case. That's, that's creating a testament to my parents. I'd like to also ask for the cards, some of the cards to be brought out while I ask one more question. Um, it was brought out in the film that that entire New York jury did not have one Jewish individual on it. Do you believe that anti-Semitism was a factor in this case? No. Okay. Robert. Uh, <laughs> I think I set something up here. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's important in sort of playing this out. You can, you can become such an advocate for your own side that every little point that can help it, you bring to bear. And sometimes in doing that, you lose sight of the truth. Uh, for instance, uh, the defense screened also challenged uh, potential jurors who were Jewish. Uh, it was not just the prosecution. Now, the reasoning for that I'm not sure of, but it was not necessarily anti-Semitism that kept Jews off the jury. However, that's a different question from whether anti-Semitism played a role in the case. I think it did. Uh, you know, anti-Semitism is with us today. It was, it was existed then. Uh, I think that the, it's important to realize that the judge and the pros, most of the prosecution were, were Jewish, uh, that the need to wrap yourself in the flag and make sure that the American public could distinguish between the good Jews and the bad Jews and that not all Jews were communists uh, was one of the reasons for the death sentence. And I think the fact that the defendants were Jewish was one of the reasons that the public accepted the death sentence. I, I also think we ought to 
distinguish between anti-Semitism as a factor in the actual prosecution of the case and anti-Semitism as it resulted from the case. And I think that there you have no question but that the case gave the anti-Semites a field day. I mean, there was vicious anti-Semitic poetry written based on my parents' case. There were horrendous anti-Semitic letters written to appeals court judges, uh, which have been found in their files by researchers many, many years later, which uh, whether or not it inf influenced the judges, it just indicates the kind of climate that existed in society. Uh, but the major thing, and I think this is extremely important and fits in very well with the first film. I don't know how many of you, not all of you were here for the first film because I was in the audience then and it was a little bit smaller audience. Uh, the theme, the theme of these two films, of course, is the pervasive anti-communist, uh, mindless anti-communism. That's the term I use uh, because one can not be a communist. One can even oppose the United States Communist Party on many, many issues. In fact, one can oppose it on every single issue without being what I call a mindless anti-communist. Now, what's that mean? It basically means that you have allowed yourself to get into a mindset where anything that the communists are in favor of or anything that anybody who is associated with a communist is in favor of or anything that sounds like it is very much like what communists are in favor of, that you don't take it seriously. That if anybody wants to poo-poo an argument, all they have to do is link it to something some communist has said. Now, Joe McCarthy was a, from our vantage point, an almost comical extreme of doing this kind of thing, but as Joseph Welsh, the Army Council, indicated when McCarthy tried to smear his, one of his young lawyers working with him, he could have ruined that man's life with that one sentence on national television. And those kinds of things happened over and over and over again. And I think the jurors were prepared to believe that as communists, my parents could have and must have wanted to be spies. And it's that kind of linkage that is extremely important in explaining a whole pattern of American history from this period. So that I think that in seeing both of these films, what we're really looking at is we're looking at how a monolithic public opinion was created based on fraud. And that's our thesis, that there's a basic fraud involved, the fraud in our parents' case, foreign spies, masquerading as domestic radicals. They weren't really interested in the domestic. They weren't just American communists. They were agents of a foreign power. Stole the secret of the atom bomb. They weren't playing around. They actually accomplished something and placed our nation's very survival in jeopardy. And the government goes ahead and says, you see, better watch out. And then the public turns around and writes the government a blank check to do anything it wants to protect us from them. And the ultimate result of that is a silent public blithely accepting the government lies as hundreds of thousands of American soldiers are marched off to Vietnam 10 years later with the resulting casualties and the resulting anger when people finally woke up in the 1960s, hey, we've been lied to for 10 years and look at how many people have been killed because of this. So, I mean, we like to say that in a very real sense, the casualties in our parents' case include all the people who died in Indochina. Also, if uh, people still have additional questions that they want to write down, there are ushers in the center aisles in the back and just signal to them to, to pick that up, please. Um, and I got some more just now. Uh, one question, why didn't experts such as Morrison appear in the courtroom as witnesses? Was their lawyer the best? Could they afford the best? Okay. Uh, last first, uh, Emanuel Block was Net, not the, the best attorney uh, they could find. He was a dedicated, uh, dedicated to the cause. He was very courageous, but he was the only attorney who would take the case. Uh, the ACLU later on uh, stated that there were no issues of civil liberties involved and declined to become involved. Uh, this was the McCarthy period, and as strange as that may seem, that was the case then. Uh, so there were mistakes made by the defense. However, I think it's important to realize 
that the best attorneys of the day, the best quote unquote left wing attorneys of the day, uh, were also trying cases during that time. And by and large, they were losing. Uh, it's my contention that if you put, you know, William Kunstler and uh, Leonard Weinglass and a whole bunch of others up in front of the jury and had them do a dance, it wouldn't have worked. The conviction came down because the jury felt that my parents were communists and that communists were evil. And that's, I mean, there, were other, there was other evidence that was brought to bear, but it's that, as my brother just explained, uh, that really brought about the conviction. And while the defense made mistakes, it's important to realize, and I, I was sitting up in the back row uh, listening to the film, and I heard someone comment, they could have, you know, a good lawyer would have made, you know, would have really helped out. A good lawyer would have created a better record for us to work with, but I don't think it would have made a difference then. Uh, and what was the first part of that? Uh, Morrison. 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 Why, Morrison. Why didn't okay, he appear they, as a witness? You want to go with that? Well, I, I, to be honest, I don't know. I think part of it was that the lawyers actually were not even in a position to understand the scientific evidence. What they were faced with was the possibility that some espionage had occurred and their job was to make it clear to the jury that their clients had nothing to do with it. Now one way of doing that was to say, okay, all this scientific testimony is true and Gold is a spy and Greenglass is a spy and we're not going to contest it, but my clients weren't involved in it. Now what's the alternative? The alternative is to say Greenglass is pleading guilty but he isn't really a spy. Gold is pleading guilty but he isn't really a spy. Despite all these diagrams and the scientists testifying, uh, there is no secret of the atom bomb to steal. The government is perpetrating this gigantic fraud on you. Now, I believe that, and I believe an awful lot of Americans, beginning with 1973, became willing to believe that also. In 1950, if you try to present that kind of case to a jury then, I mean, you'd be laughed out of court. So it's much easier to say, yes, we accept this part of the government's case, but my clients weren't involved, and that's what they did. Now, sure, looking back, they couldn't have made a wrong, a more wrong choice, but I think that's the basis of the action. If the Rosenbergs were to have been at the core of a spy ring, why, after 30 years, have no other members of that ring ever been caught? Well, there was a, uh, a network that was supposedly pursued of people. There were I think the figure was 18 names that were, were brought out. Various other cases were linked to this. Uh, but an FBI report in the mid-50s, uh, a few years after the execution, uh, was very revealing in when it stated that the leads could not be substantiated. And it was never, it was never followed any further. Uh, I think this is proof that such aspiring did not really exist. Uh, but I think it points to what the government was trying to do. I don't think the government set out uh, to murder my parents. I think they fully expected that they would cooperate, meaning that they would uh, say, we're guilty and we'll tell you who else did it. Uh, my parents were not uh, political leaders. Uh, they were not big names, uh, but maybe they were the link to point the finger at the big names. Uh, when the prosecuting attorney, uh, Kilsheimer. Kilsheimer it is, yeah, uh, states that if they had only talked, we'd have the biggest spy case known to man or something like that, that's exactly, that's very revealing of what the government was attempting to do. Uh, and that's, but it didn't work. And further, one of the interesting, one of the things the FBI documents have since revealed is that as early as 10 days before the trial, the documents state that they have no evidence against my mother. And then they basically say, well, but if we, if we can get a long sentence for her, if we can involve her and get a long sentence for her, it can be used as a lever against Julius. So basically, and then of course the judge went whole hog and gave a death sentence. Uh, basically the whole point of convicting my mother was to get my father to talk. Uh, and the whole thing about you know, the open telephone line to J. Edgar Hoover's office, the whole sort of talk or die blackmail that was played out. 
that the press crowed about, about how great our American, Bob Considine gets up and says, isn't it wonderful our American system of justice, you know? They had a chance to save themselves up until the last minute. You know, now we look at it and we're horrified. But it shows just how far uh, we can go. And I think one of the dangers that I want to point out is that to this very day, we can be manipulated. We like to look back on the past and think how far we've come and how superior we are and how much more sophisticated we are today. Uh, I don't think that's so true. Uh, I think that we are, remain open to manipulation. And I, you know, this, uh, I doubt that uh, uh, Colonel Omar Gaddafi is uh, particularly popular with this audience uh, or very many other audience in America, but I want to remind you of something, that there was this Libyan hit squad that supposedly wandered around the United States attempting to assassinate Ronald Reagan that kept him from attending Christmas services. He had to have it in his, in his room, you know, because he was scared to go out uh, in the White House. Whatever happened to that Libyan hit squad? Uh, you know, the public was up in arms about it. It's my contention that there might very well have been a Libyan hit squad. I really don't know. I wouldn't put it past them. But at the same time, it might not have existed. And just think about how many Americans today were manipulated by that. What kind of political activities are you involved in now? We need you in the disarmament movement. <laughs> we were there June 12th. <laughs> Our whole families were there. I happen to agree. Uh, Robbie, in fact, is a, uh, well, tell him what you're doing. Well, it's a, I, I'm going to be doing it for another week. I'm actually on my way to law school. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I doubt I will be trying this case. But, uh, but uh, I've been working for the last six months for a public foundation called the Peace Development Fund. Uh, what we do is we raise money uh, from individuals across the country and distribute it directly to grassroots organizing uh, across the country. Uh, we, you may think, well, why don't, why don't people just give? Well, uh, there are so many groups in a, in a decentralized and very democratic movement uh, that it's impossible for one person to figure out how to most valuably uh, spend the few dollars that they have to spare, or in some cases, the thousands of dollars that they have to spare. Uh, and that's the work that's, that's going on. Uh, so I, you know, I think Philip Morrison said a, a very wonderful thing, which I'd forgotten uh, in hearing it, the movie the last time, that struck home today. And that was his statement that what's true then is true now, that there never was a secret, there never will be a defense. The only defense is world peace. And E.L. Doctorow and Robert Cover have dealt with the case in fictional form. How do you feel about their novels? I don't know what Rob thinks about uh, public burning. I know we differ on uh, Ed Doctorow's book. Uh, I think it's a fine novel. Uh, it moved me a great deal. And uh, since I know I'm not Daniel Isaacson and I haven't behaved the way Daniel Isaacson did, it doesn't bother me. Now, people who thought of it as a novelization of reality and thought that he was saying that I was like that or that Robbie was my disturbed sister who committed suicide, uh, I can see people getting upset about that. But if you recognize that it's his novelist's conception of what that kind of thing could do to two people, I think it's a good piece of writing. Uh, Bob Coover's book uh, happens to be one of the, my favorite political novels ever. I mean, his characterization of Richard Nixon is so masterful that uh, I've recommended that in people who are doing uh, political novels that they use the book. Uh, and I, uh, I say this never having met Bob Coover and not uh, having any interest whatsoever in the book's success. Uh, uh, well, I don't, I don't like uh, the book of Daniel for personal reasons, uh, which Michael has already stated. Uh, uh, I don't like it for political reasons because while I think it has had a positive effect, I think the message of the book is a cynical message that basically says that people that are get, if you get involved in politics, it will destroy you, it will dehumanize you. And I think that power does corrupt and that politics often do have a dehumanizing effect. 
But I think if we do not become involved, uh, then we leave the stage uh, bare to those who already are there. And I look around the political scene in this country today, and I'm not terribly pleased uh, with who I see uh, in positions of power. So that, that novel disturbs me for political reasons. I have to admit that on the public burning, I probably have the, the worst review possible, which is that I read 23 pages and I couldn't handle the stream of consciousness style. And I have no further comment. <laughs> have you ever confronted your uncle David Greenglass regarding the case? Do you know where he is now? Have you been in touch with him or with other family members? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you never change your name back to Rosenberg? Well, I'll answer for myself. Uh, the name, I've grown up with the name Mirapol since I was six. Uh, it's the name I think of myself as. Uh, I think it would be somewhat of an artificial act to change my name back. I'm not trying to hide behind that name. In fact, Michael and I have occasionally joked that Rosenberg is a much more uh, common name that if we wanted to become more anonymous, we would change our names back to Rosenberg. Uh, but I think there's also another element, uh, and that is that it's maybe it's for me it's a it's a question of just a little bit of distance. Uh, I'm you know I'm a person in my own right. I do not want to be swallowed up as sort of a, a symbolic figure, uh, and. It's, it's just a way of, of, of keeping my own identity. Yeah. Um, the only time we could have ever conceived of doing it was when Rob turned 21, which was in uh, 1968. And at that time, uh, we didn't have any you know, role to play in trying to be involved in any reopening effort. We, I actually had talked to Morty Sobel's lawyers and asked if there was anything that we could do. And uh, about two or three months later, he was released. And uh, we, we felt that at that time doing it, if it weren't part of any political effort, there was no reason to do it. Then when we got involved politically, it, it did seem very artificial. I mean, we, were, we became a sort of a, a long name, Michael and Robbie Mirapol, the sons of Ethel and Julius Rosenberg. <laughs> and there was also the element of our adoptive parents. I mean, they had... Uh, raised us, uh, been through a lot with us, and as a, as a token of respect and uh, affection, uh, we've, I felt personally that uh, there was a lot to be said for keeping that name, not to mention the fact that we were married and had families, and that would have involved changing the names of other people, not just ourselves. So uh, it's an interesting question, and maybe, you know, looking back on what might have been back sometime in the 50s, something might have been different, but it wasn't. Please comment on recent government statements that the Rosenbergs were connected to aspiring via the decoding of a Russian code book. Aha, great, great question. I'm glad you asked that. I, I, I might have had to bring it up anyway. We, um, for those that don't know this, and when ABC did a story about J. Edgar Hoover, there was a short little blip about the discovery of a Russian code book in the uh, snows of Finland during the 1940 Russo-Finnish War led to the breaking of the code by which the Russian government communicated with their people in all over the world. And so they were, in effect, listening in on the Russians all through the 1940s and who knows, maybe the 50s, et cetera. And ABC said that one of the FBI agents involved in the investigation, a man named Robert Lamphere, had told them that that code book led directly to the conviction of my parents, that it led to the apprehension of over 200 spies and that the government knew my parents were guilty as a result of the intercepting of messages long before they put together the evidence at the trial. Now, the information that supposedly corroborates what he said is supposed to be in FBI files. Now, we've had a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit against the government on this issue since 1975. The first time this piece of news occurred was in 1977 when there was a Newsweek story about it. Then there was another Newsweek story about it in 1980. Exact same thing using Lamphere as the source. Uh, this ABC News story, in other words, is a rehash of something that's five years old. And ever since 1977, we've been saying to the government, 
give us whatever you're going to give Lamphere. And we're just waiting for these documents. Now, finally, I must tell you that my lawyer was in Washington just yesterday and said that he finally got the government to agree to give us a number of specific documents that we'd been able to identify as dealing with this issue, including Lamphere's Freedom of Information Act request, correspondence back and forth, plus documents. Now, what is there to this? As far as we can tell on the basis of other documents that we have, as well as independent corroboration from British intelligence, that the only information that was gotten from intercepting messages had to do with identifying a scientist in the British group that was building the atom bomb. In other words, it leads to Fuchs. You still have to go from Fuchs to Gold to Greenglass to my parents to get to them. There's nothing independent, at least as far as we can tell, in this material that Lamphere is talking about that goes directly to my parents. Now we have, interestingly enough, another viewpoint from two researchers who interviewed Lamphere, I believe in 1980 or 81, it was published in a letter to the Nation magazine just recently, in which Lamphere said something entirely different from what ABC says he said, namely that the intercepted messages led to somebody trying to recruit Max Elicher. You remember Max Elicher? He was a witness who had some very shaky testimony about supposedly trying to be recruited by both Morty Sobel and my father. And Lamphere is quoted as saying that as soon as they found this out, they're looking for somebody who tried to recruit Elicher, but they don't know who it is. Now, how that could become in ABC definite positive proof that it's my father, yeah, I leave it to you to try and figure out. As soon as the FBI files come out, we can look at them and see if this is a real new piece of evidence, if it's nothing more than the old story again, uh, etc. As far as I can tell so far, with all the documents that's been released, there is absolutely nothing besides the old Fuchs to Gold to Greenglass to Rosenberg story. And if, in fact, Gold is a very unreliable witness, and if, in fact, Greenglass perjured himself on a number of occasions, the government's case begins to crumble. And nothing in all of the FBI files has helped to rehabilitate any of the Gold and Greenglass testimony. Why was this trial in civil court if treason is a crime? That point of civil court not needing corroboration by second witnesses seems important. Well. It's not a question of civil court. It's a question of why was it conspiracy instead of treason. Uh, you know, it's very interesting. The judge, Judge Kaufman, in the sentencing, uses the word treason, which is a technical legal term. So does the um, program of this film, yeah. which is not true. Right. OK. Uh, it's, treason is a very technical term. Uh, and it has to be corroborated. There has to be at least one overt act, maybe, maybe more. There are two overt acts. Thank you. Uh, there has to, it has to be corroborated by outside witnesses, alleged, the testimony of alleged co-conspirators, that is people who say, you know, we were involved, but we're uh, going to help get the other people who were involved by turning state's evidence. That's not uh, acceptable evidence. All of these things make it much more difficult to get a treason conviction. And the reason it's difficult is because in setting up this government, in response to the British system in the late 1700s, people recognized, the, the quote unquote founding fathers recognized that the political nature of treason trials and tried to keep politics out of the courtroom. What the government in the 50s did was use the, the ease and the rules of evidence and the simplicity of getting a conviction in a conspiracy trial, but convinced the public that really what was being tried was treason. In fact, in a conspiracy trial, the government didn't have to prove that anything actually occurred. All it had to prove was that two or more people got together and planned to do something. And that's really crucial in this case, because you see, you know those drawings that you saw up there? Uh, in 1966, after they, had, they were kept secret for many years, the defense won the right to have them released and shown to scientists. And the prosecution 
in those hearings where they were finally released said you can't release these, they're going to damage, it's going to damage our national security, it's going to be a terrible thing. Finally the release occurred. When the release occurred, the, doc, the drawings were shown to people like Philip Morris and they looked at them and said this is ridiculous. There's no secret here. This is not, uh, not valuable. The director of the lens mold division looked at the sketch and said, you know, it's like somebody were to draw an outline of an automobile and label the front end motor and say build a car. It's the same kind of thing. It doesn't, it doesn't help you produce anything. Well, okay, what did the prosecution say in response to this? This was a motion to get Morton Sobel released from prison at the time he was still in jail. Uh, the prosecution said this is a conspiracy case. It doesn't matter that what was stolen was, had no value. All that mattered was that they tried to steal something. So again, you can see that by the government's own admission in the late 1960s, nothing of value was taken in this case. Uh, and that's a, a relatively little known fact. And I want to point out to you that probably most Americans to this day, if they know about the case, think that my parents are guilty. You know, why do they think that? And what do we get? You know, well, we, people very rarely debate us, but in the few debates that we get and the, when we hear the other side, what does the other side say? The other side primarily says they were convicted, the appeals were turned down, and they were communists. Taking the communist issue aside, basically what the other side says is our system is so credible that once you get a conviction and once an appeal is denied, that's enough to sell it to the American public. And that's, that's the key thing here, that people generally believe that our system of justice does not break down in this manner, and it's that credibility that the other side uses to this day. And also, it answers the question, why is the frame up so flimsy? You know, why are there silly little things like Harry Gold signing his name on the card? I mean, couldn't the FBI have done a better job than that? And what about that jello box top? You know, silly things like the jello box top is cut funny. Well, what's the point of cutting a jello box top? You know, what's the point of having a, a thing like that? You want to have something that's unique, that can't be reproduced, so you can slip in an FBI agent with another jello box top. But if you think about it, all you have to do to reproduce a cut is to just take the half and cut, retrace the cut. You can produce dozens of identical jello box tops in that manner. All you have to do to make sure you can't reproduce it is to tear it. Okay, there's simple little things like that that, that show you that the, the not very much thought went into this. Well, why? Because they didn't need to. All they had to do was get enough evidence together to make a conviction. And once they got the conviction, the credibility of the American judicial system would make that conviction hold. And that's one of the reasons why Alger Hiss has been turned down for the 32nd time and why we can't make any head of, uh, headway in the courts. It's because what's really at issue here is the basic credibility of our judicial system. Why was the obvious contradiction on the Hilton Hotel registration not challenged in court? Again, it's the story about the defense strategy being that gold is a spy, green glass is a spy. We are not going to counter any of that testimony. We are just going to say, hey, this doesn't prove that my client is a spy. Now, gold said on the stand he never met my father. Therefore, the government, in effect, gold didn't have anything to say about the guilt or innocence of my parents. All Gold did was say, I'm guilty and Greenglass is guilty. Now, Manny Block knew that Gold was a pathological liar because he'd seen Gold perform in a previous trial where Gold was subject to a very strong cross-examination and the same judge, Judge Kaufman, had protected Gold, intervened to you know, reduce the strategy of the defense attorney and Gold himself had admitted on the witness stand, I lied so much it's no wonder steam didn't come out of my ears. Now, the jury still believed Gold and convicted those defendants. And I, Gloria Agron is a, Gloria Agron Josephson, who was Manny's assistant, is a good family friend. And I remember way back when I was a young teenager, Gloria telling me that she and Manny had decided not to cross-examine Gold because they were so grateful that this man with so much garbage in his head had never said, had never made up a story about all the times he'd been out drinking with Julie and talked about espionage. And they were afraid if they cross-examined him, suddenly he'd remember that. And 
they said they thought they'd gotten away without him creating all this incredible stuff. I mean, he could have said that Robbie was named after him. Robbie's middle name is Harry. You had to bring that up. <laughs> we have time for just one or two more questions. What did you think of Neiser's book, Implosion Conspiracy? Oh, I thought it was an extremely dishonest uh, attempt to convince the public that they'd gotten a fair trial and they were guilty. I mean, to give you an example, it was written in 1973, uh, and uh, the Schneer book was written in 1965. If you look at the sources that Neiser con consulted, the Schneer book's not listed there. And there isn't one bit of evidence in his book that indicates that he's read the Schneer book. And in fact, there isn't one refutation of any of the points that Schneer raises. And it's merely just ignored totally. And we are left with the trial testimony. Now, if you do the Dreyfus case and you stop at the first court martial, Dreyfus is guilty. It's only later on when it's a forgery and Esther Hauser changes his testimony that you realize the first court-martial was a fraud. Well, you do the Rosenberg case and you end in 1951 at the end of the trial, there's no new evidence, there's no perjury about I come from Judas, there's none of that stuff. And that's a very dishonest effort to, uh, you know, it was going to be a movie by Otto Preminger, it never was made, but uh, he made a lot of money off the book. Finally, from uh, Lee Lipton, age 13, what do you both see as the future of this case? Well, I think we've, well, you never can tell, okay? You know, like uh, the future always surprises us, or at least it usually does. Uh, you, there might be some break somewhere. Uh, we have FBI documents that I can't imagine why they release them to us. Uh, We've got documents uh, on the judge in particular. I, wanna, I don't want to end this, uh, this, this evening without saying a few words about Judge Kaufman, who is uh, still the, uh, the chief judge of the retired. Second, second district. Well, he's just retired. Good. Uh, <laughs> he, well, you know, um, it's, he talked about many things at the case. He said uh, tremendous uh, statements in his, in his uh, sentencing speech about the Korean War and tens of thousands of deaths, and he other, uh, talked about how my parents were, were neglectful of their children, they loved communism more than their children, uh, all, all these sort of things, and, and, and we now have all these FBI documents that showed that after the conviction occurred, that he coached the FBI. I mean, we have documents in which he's, he's, he's advising the FBI what sort of steps to take to make, to make sure the execution occurs in the spring of 1953. This is supposedly impartial judge. Uh, there's, there, there's, there's amazing stuff in there. Personal letters thanking Jed Hoover for doing personal investigative work on people who are critical of his role 20 years later. All sorts of stuff. We would have never dreamed we'd gotten any of that. Well, in the same manner, we don't know what's going to come with this case. We might get things that surprise us. Uh, but barring that kind of a surprise, I think that, that in general, as time goes on and more knowledge sort of seeps, in, seeps into the public, uh, that there'll eventually be some sort of statement about the wrong that was done. Uh, but I don't expect anything dramatic in the near future. Yeah, I think that and maybe, maybe some activists will, will, will disagree with me, but I think that it's become a case for the historians. Uh, there are an awful lot of things going on today. Uh, the disarmament movement was mentioned. There are political trials that occur today. There are injustices attempting to be perpetrated. There's a really gross effort to re-monolithize public opinion uh, by uh, gutting the Freedom of Information Act, by uh, Reach, changing the classification standards of the government. All of these efforts, uh, attempts to hold hearings on terrorism and create this idea that uh, there's this terrible terror network that uh, we have to watch out for and we have to unleash the CIA and FBI and permit them to do all the things that they did in the 50s and 60s that was illegal then, and now we have to let them do it because they, our nation is you know, stark and naked before the world. Uh, all of these kinds of efforts are underway. And uh, the truth about my parents' case is one element in the strategy of the government, and therefore it certainly is, I feel it's important to, to seek to try to bring that truth out. But I think that given the, 
nature of the documents that exist and the, the efforts that uh, have been already made, that it's really now a question of getting as much information out, getting the research done, getting books published, uh, and uh, you know, letting the ultimate decision be made by uh, the public, as I said, you know, the poets and playwrights and, and, and people of, history, of, of the future. And uh, I see it as a generational process. I mean, when my children are my age, I hope that the average intelligent American is going to know in their gut that just as I knew as I was growing up that Sacco and Vanzetti were innocent, that they will know that my folks were innocent and that this was a fraud perpetrated on the American people. Now, that I think is a much less dramatic thing than finding a document that's J. Edgar Hoover thanking the FBI agents for uh, framing my father. Uh, I would have loved to find that and I was partially naive enough to think we might find something that dramatic, but we didn't. And as Robbie says, who knows? There may be some things that dramatic. Certainly, the uh, I come from Julius thing is extremely dramatic. The, the fact that my mother, there was nothing against her until six weeks before the trial and then all of a sudden, the key trial testimony, remember? Ethel did the typing. The first time anyone said that to the FBI was in January 1951. We've, we've got those documents. And before then, they kept bemoaning that they don't have much of a case against her, but they have to use her as a lever against my father. So there are some very dramatic things in the files. And uh, as that information becomes public knowledge, I expect more and more people to come around to our views. I don't want to leave tonight also without giving you something to do if you want to do something. Uh, one very simple thing is that there are repeated attempts on the part of the government to uh, the executive branch of government in particular uh, to gut the Freedom of Information Act. Without that, that act, we would not have so much valuable information. Uh, without a Freedom of Information Act, I don't think we really have a democracy because we don't have an informed electorate, which is the cornerstone of a democracy. Uh, and one letter to an elected official of your choice, uh, stating that you're concerned that, uh, that by recent administration efforts to weaken the Freedom of Information Act and that you would hope that this act would be preserved and if anything strengthened uh, to preserve the public's right to know, I think would, uh, would be a good act to take. Uh, there might be others as well. I'm not saying that's the only thing you should do, but that's one concrete action that can be taken. Well, on behalf of the 92nd Street Y, I'd like to thank you, Robert and Michael Miracle. Thank you. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.